welcome uh, everyone to this um, second in the cluster of um, Esprit seminars, uh, online seminars on periodicals um, and the law. Um, and um, sorry about the rather uh, bumpy start today, but uh, I think we should be uh, very grateful indeed <laughs> to Nora and to Micah for, for rescuing us um, from a broken Zoom link. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to, to both of you. Um, I, I, I have to start, I'm afraid, with some unfortunate news, which is that um, Anne Hale is unable uh, to be with us today, uh, unavoidably so. Um, uh, and I, I hope we can hear her paper at a, at a later date on a, on, a, on a different occasion. However, Andrew King, um, our other speaker today, will instead give a, a slightly longer presentation. And um, I think we should all be enormously grateful to him um, for, um, uh, for that. I think it's, before I pass on to Andrew, just worth noting one thing. Um, when the idea of drawing together a network of those um, working in periodicals and the law across the continent of Europe and indeed beyond was first mooted at the Esprit Committee a few months ago, few of us could have foreseen that by the time they went on air, so to speak, um, the legal status of the press would have become such an urgent political, constitutional and cultural issue, especially here in the United Kingdom, though not exclusively so. The successful legal action um, taken by the Duke of Sussex, uh, King Charles's youngest son, against Reach, owners of the Mir Mirror and Express group of newspapers, has established um, beyond all doubt in a court of law that editors and journalists routinely used illegal methods of news collection. Um, including phone hacking um, to, to, to elicit information from individuals and even from children. But it also brings that, that judgment, which is astonishing, it's available online now, brings other targets into view, especially so the tabloids of the Mail Group, um, owned by the fourth Viscount of Rothermere, and News International, uh, particularly the Sun newspaper owned by Rupert Murdoch. And these debates, these social debates about the relationship between uh, the press and the law have real world um, uh, implications and consequences. Uh, one thinks, for example, of Laurel Brake's um, uh, brilliant co-authored um, co volume, co-edited volume, um, uh, which came back uh, out in uh, two 2015 on the peremptory uh, killing off of a, um, of a historic British um, Sunday uh, newspaper title, The News of the World. Um, by uh, by Murdoch in, in 2011, uh, after his own um, phone hacking uh, crisis. Now, this isn't the time to go into the Leveson inquiry, although that's very much back on the political agenda here of, of 2011. But that inquiry focused precisely on the regulation of the press, the legal re regulation of the press. And its initial report <clears throat> highlighted the ways in which state power the police and such regulatory, arms length regulatory bodies as the Press Complaints Commission operated or failed to operate, um, uh, 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 and sometimes operated illegally and corruptly. And most egregiously, perhaps, um, uh, it, it, it showed, and the subsequent discussion showed how owners of organizations could avoid or even materially influence legal frameworks and their enforcement. Now we'll be hearing a lot more about that, I think, in the coming in the coming months, particularly about ownership and regulation, journalism and the law. But put all that together, and I think what it suggests is that press regulation can't really historically be reduced to um, the letter of the law or to specific acts of parliament. Uh, and can't be inferred from it either, um, or, or particular policies of political parties or, or, or particular taxes. S press regulation, in, in a far more immediate sense, I think, is a, is a far more complex set of negotiations between a range of different um, players and agencies working in different ways with different outcomes over periods of time. And to tell us more about that, 
and how that nexus of politics, um, uh, the law and periodical production um, played itself out in the mid 19th century, particularly in the United Kingdom, perhaps. We're very fortunate indeed uh, today to have uh, Professor Andrew King of Greenwich University, Professor of English at Greenwich University London with us today. Andrew, as I'm sure um, you're all very, uh, very well aware, has written prolifically about the Victorian press, including in some eight books and a large number of other uh, uh, significant, important articles. He was a founding editor of Victorian popular fictions and is now writing a chapter on the global economics of the periodical together with a, a four volume uh, annotated collection of primary sources, uh, which is putting together with uh, Marissa Damore, Andrew Hobbs, who will be presenting a paper at our next meeting in January, um, and Lisa Peters, uh, um, that will be coming out uh, uh, under the title Geographies of the Press. And I'm sure we're all looking forward enormously to seeing that uh, on our shelves. Today's paper though, um, is a foretaste of another chapter Andrew has completed recently on the 1860s, um, uh, edited by Pamela Gilbert and which will be published by Cambridge University Press uh, sometime next year. So Andrew, please take us beyond the taxes on knowledge. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Generous and actually extremely helpful. Uh, introduction. I also really want to thank Nora and Micah for sorting out the technological problems uh, today. Uh, really, I'm very grateful indeed. It's a great honour to be here with you. I'm very sorry uh, not to share space with Anne. And I'll do my best to make up for her absence, even though I'm very conscious that that's not possible. While I shall say a few words about how law and ownership of uh, uh, periodical press intersect. It certainly won't be as sophisticated as what I know Anne does. And uh, if Anne ever gets to listen to this, uh, I hope that she gets well very soon um, and that she should know that her expertise and herself are very sorely missed. I also want to apologise to Yelena and Michael for missing their talks on the 17th of November because like many of us, I, I was busy teaching. Now, although I shall tell individual stories and shall remain local to English and Welsh legislation in the 1860s, the main point of my talk is actually much more general. And that is, the relations between the law and the press are everywhere, as Alad reminded us, much more complicated than a focus on various forms of censorship uh, suggest. That is a kind of favorite target. Uh, of research for us, isn't it? Now, I'm not at all suggesting that the legal regulation of access to and the content of the press is unimportant. On the contrary, we certainly know it is. Um, only that the relations between the law and the press in different states across Europe, and this is where I'm particularly interested, might involve matters other than the state control of access and content. My query, actually, raises questions of what the field of law and the periodical press might be. Now, oops, if it's going to let me progress, I don't know that it is to go to the next slide. Here we go. I have to do that. Now, I have here on the screen the latest, the 5th 2023 edition of one of the standard undergraduate textbooks on media and entertainment law. Uh, it's by the uh, Ursula Smart, and it's 600 pages, it's pretty hefty. It's uh, contents pages uh, show 10 chapters that aim to mark out, define the field as it's uh, commonly understood. Only some of these areas uh, shall I cover, and indeed I shall end by focusing on two areas of the law which are not uh, in this understanding regarded as media law, and yet which were to me, or which are to me, vital in understanding what periodicals actually are. You can see here we've got uh, freedom of expression, an old cherry that's uh, familiar to us all. Um, I'm not going to be talking about that, sorry. Um, what Alid was talking about, of course, is the confidentiality and privacy field. 
uh, although it really comes to the fore in the late 20th century and of course now um ursula uh, smart traces it back to 1849 when some printers exhibited reproductions of drawings made for private use by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Albert had sent them for copying for private distribution to printers in Windsor, and the printers naughtily subsequently sought to sell them on the open market, a case that came to court, surprise, surprise, uh, in Albert's favour. I'm not going to be talking about that either, though, because that's really is less important in the 19th century than it is in the 20th and 21st. Defamation is another matter. This comes under the common law of tort, uh, and it's occasionally supplemented by statute. And I think this double law of common law and uh, statutory law uh, in Britain is a, a bit peculiar. And... Uh, uh, is something that we'll certainly uh, return to. Now, defamation law includes libel, and I'll certainly uh, be discussing that, uh, describing cases involving that later. Um, I'm going to be missing out quite a lot of it, uh, a lot of these areas. Uh, the next one I'll be thinking about is uh, regulation, uh, in the sense that 1860s press regulation was what Ursula calls co-regulation, uh, which is something that Alan was actually uh, describing. It's a kind of hybrid of self-regulation and statutory law uh, for um, Ursula anyway, though in the 1860s there were no codes of practice such as we have today or industry-read regulatory bodies such as the one that Alan mentioned, the Press Complaints Commission. Now, such bodies are mainly post-World War II and even later. Uh, and in the 1860s, though, we'll, we'll see a different kind of co-regulation, a mix of the statutory and the customary. Um, there were industry bodies at the time, but they were organised according to labour, not according to standards of content. I'm going to pass over um, eight and ten uh, to then, uh, and also I'm only going to mention uh, chapter nine because I'm afraid time doesn't allow us to uh, have a look at copyright. And anyway, it's an area that I'm sure you all know uh, very well indeed. Now, I've gone through all of that to remind myself, really, that the regulation of the press involves not only diverse areas, but a diverse set of actants who will all interact in various ways and with various degrees of pressure. Government and legislation, not always identical, of course. Industry, which includes owners and managers, I'm not even going to put workers there, because owners and managers may have different conflicting aims. There are content producers and distributors. What such a textbook as Ursula's um, suggests, uh, what it leaves out, rather, sorry, it also fascinates me. Such textbooks are aimed at trainee and would-be lawyers and journalists. And so they leave out laws covering ownership, which is a speciality, of course, um, including, as we'll find out, the machinery and the buildings on which uh, periodical production depends. Then what of the regulations, statutory or otherwise, of the conditions of many workers in the media, from cleaners to editors, compositors to binders and paper manufacturers, importers and exporters of printing machinery, as well as tax? Then there are the inventors of machinery, and uh, a particular case I'm going to be talking about the bookshop staff. Law is a very important regulator of all these actants in the, in the process and product which together constitute a periodical. But as I've said, um, law is, uh, in the 1860s, sorry, uh, in England and Wales, the law interacts with custom and not least with laws which media law textbooks don't typically cover. I think that's my major point there, I think. Um, I want to start with another observation, and that's 
uh, that we need to be very careful about um, not assuming that the abolition of a regulatory law is the same as freedom. As uh, the subtitle of this very famous account suggests, um, all that is abolition had instantaneous effects. Um, this point to me is visible in the most famous uh, governmental intervention in publishing of the 1860s, which is the abolition of the taxes on paper which took place on the 30th of May, 1861. The paper tax was the last of the remaining taxes on knowledge that had sought to control the market for print and thereby discourage or prevent social unrest. Most of the taxes on knowledge had been repealed the previous decade, and the continuation of the paper tax had been discussed in Parliament for several years before 1861. Indeed, the length of the discussion of the uh, abolition of the law caused manufacturers to lower production and dealers to hold on to stock just to see what would happen. And this in turn caused a paper shortage for the majority of 1859 to 1861, therefore obviously stymieing uh, the periodical industry. Prices didn't rise, trade simply stagnated. And surprisingly, after repeal, there was a glut of paper, so that in early 1862, the price of paper dramatically dropped. Um, then, gradually, uh, they rose to pre-repeal levels. Now, that has obviously had a huge effect on what we think of as the sensation novel and sensational uh, stories and the rise of uh, many kinds of periodicals in the uh, early 1860s. The point is, though, the effect of the repeal it preceded the repeal itself, but also it has much slower effects on the industry than has often been claimed. Fox Bourne claimed in 1887 that it had a remarkable and sudden effect uh, on the industry. Well, that's not true. In reality, other kinds of legal regulation had at least as great an impact, though they're less easy to fit into a, a heroic narrative of liberation from government control. Now, what I want to discuss here is not the taxes on knowledge. I want to think about um, the following. Uh, these all had significant effects. The least of them, though, is obscenity, which, of course, is perhaps the, the most, uh, most discussed of all of these, um, um, uh, these laws. Now, while I did promise to copy, uh, discuss proper copyrights, I said I know it's very commonly discussed in fora such as these, and as a result, um, apologies, I decided to to omit it. Now, I only want to start with a few words on obscenity, precisely because we all know about it. I'll discuss libel at greater length. Now, as we know the Obscene Publications Act passed in April 50, 1857, was only solidified into the form that persisted for a century afterwards in 1867, when the Queen versus Benjamin Hicklin defined tax as obscene if they had a tendency to deprave and corrupt. The tendency did not depend on the intention of the author publisher or retailer, but on the nature, the tendency of the material itself, which included the circumstances of the publication. And a clear example uh, given in the, in the case, the Benjamin Hicklin case, was that a medical treatise might be considered obscene, but it would not be subject to prosecution as long as it was not displayed in public. And you can see uh, the illustration there. Now, I mentioned obscenity because it's often cited in histories of the press, and it's connected to the next, libel. Libel, in fact, is much more commonly invoked than obscenity in the 1860s in legal cases that involve the press. The annual Mitchell's newspaper press directory on the law of newspapers devoted far more space to libel than to obscenity. Apologies if this example comes from 1867 rather than the 1860s. Um, 
Uh, I was unable to get to the British Library to um, get images from the 1860s one. But it shows that even in 1845, libel uh, is really, really uh, much more important than any of the other laws. Libel is defined as anything which tends to uh, bring another into hatred, ridicule or contempt. And as with obscenity, and this is why I mentioned obscenity in the first place, the intentions of the producers or sellers were not relevant. Yet the bookseller uh, in, the, in 1862 complained the law was so hazy and undefined that it damaged the industry because it seemed that just negative reviews of books could be prosecuted. Ouch. The laws of libel also kept changing, which the industry didn't like either. Now, I want to give two examples that came to court of how uh, libel law was used in practice. The first one is quite a nice one. Um, the first, it took place in August 1869 and was brought by the proto-feminist publisher and editor Emily Faithful, whose all-women Victoria Press had been set up in 1860, against James Grant, the prolific author and editor of The Morning Advertiser. The Morning Advertiser had accused Faithful of atheism and belonging, goodness, to a ladies' secular club. Well, Grant willingly withdrew the statement on presentation of the evidence. Faithful was awarded 40 shillings damages and the Victoria magazine published a lead article about the case in September 1869. The case was widely reported in the press, though, with very little commentary. The bookseller was an exception in that while it admitted that Grant was a man of strong religious convictions and undoubted honour, that um, it the periodical is very clearly on faithful side. It's an interesting case of clear support for faithful by an influential industry organ when one might expect opposition to women's labour and printing. And I'm sure Marianne will have uh, words to say about that, in fact. If the faithful versus grant case was an amicable one, it's also typical. Now, the next was much more colourful. And to me, it's much more interesting but it's quite complicated. In July 1869, the famous theatrical impresario Dion Busico brought out a sensation drama called Formosa. There followed an international and national press furore over its lack of morality, a furore initiated by two long reviews in the Illustrated London News. There's the first there. Uh, it's, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, with, uh, uh, by some of you who know the Victorian codes, anonyma is a uh, kind of code word for uh, a prostitute. Um, the second of them uh, is here. Um, and uh, it demanded that um, the Lord Chamberlain protect the public even against itself by uh, closing the play down. It's a case of obscenity, you might think. Hmm. Hang on a minute. A huge amount of copy resulted, drawing on the tropes the ILN had made available. The quasi-pornography authored by the supposed prostitute anonyma, and also with the scandalous meme girl of the period, but it's not for obscenity, but libel that the play came to court. Busico decided not to prosecute the ILN, but the Pall Mall Gazette for libel of himself, since it had printed a letter uh, called State Morals, suggesting that he had rather too much knowledge of the demi-monde to have simply read about it. He must have experienced it yourself. You can see extracts uh, both from the original letter on the 9th of February there and the Palmar Gazette's uh, coverage of the libel case just a few days later. It's wonderful how quickly these cases went to court. It's really extraordinary um, how fast it all happened. Well, the Palmar Gazette, as we see reported on the 21st of February 1870, had to apologise, and the case was settled again, amicably. 
As the bookseller ironically explained, if the author and manager had paid a thousand guineas for advertisements, they could not have devised so complete and thorough a means of delicate puffery. And uh, I'm, I was intrigued to find that Le Temps in France was of exactly the same opinion and reported the case in exactly the same way. I'm not suggesting that it was copying the bookseller, but that's what their conclusion was, isn't scandal useful? Huge sales at the box office, increased sales of the press. And let's not forget that Busico, including Formosa, um, was, uh, were extensively advertised in the Illustrated London News, even in the issues with hostile reviews. The Palmar Gazette, too, repeatedly advertised both Busico plays and Busico parodies. And what the case demonstrates very clearly are the powerful commercial possibilities of what we might consider as merely restrictive legal regulation. Not only did the publishing industry as a whole benefit from the huge amount of copy generated, but print worked with the theatre to exploit the scandal that could only be enabled by uh, the law so as to generate profit for both a cross-industry synergy that's typical of the 1860s entertainment industry, as of course it still is. Um, and indeed, of course, as we saw in Ursula Smart's uh, Media and Entertainment Law book. Uh, now, I want to turn in the, the regulation of labour, because that's uh, one of the areas that media uh, law just doesn't deal with, doesn't tend to deal with. But of course, it's absolutely essential to the production of the media, and of course, the production of periodicals as well. Um, this is where the idea of what Ursula Smart calls a co-regulatory system is most evident. Contracts within law were important for the production of periodicals in the 1860s, but also agreements and customs whose relation to the law were a bit fuzzy. These two were regulatory factors that are a profound effect on periodicals and the press in general, even if they're harder to identify than simply referring to statute books, which you might under Napoleonic codes. Now, the print worker Charles Manby Smith uh, in the 1850s had vividly described how working in the printing industry was unhealthy, badly paid and under terrible physical conditions. Everything like comfort, order, economy, and even decent workmanship, he says, was sacrificed to the paramount object of dispatch, the turning out of the greatest quantity of work in the shortest time. The stationer in 1863 reported the case of a workman literally, literally torn in pieces, a quotation, uh, when cleaning uh, printing machinery, and almost every issue of the um, printing uh, related press has horrendous um, reports of things like this. There were um, regulations regarding labour and working conditions, but these, as I say, were customary rather than legislated and agreed through contract and often verbal agreement. That doesn't mean to say they're altogether outside the law, but the agreements were negotiable, local, flexible, and unrecorded often. That said, the, there were uh, common contracts um, the, and these uh, were recorded in the legal pages of uh, uh, Mitchell's newspaper press directory, for example, throughout the 1860s as models um, for uh, what could be um, said. Most of the legal requirements given in Mitchell's, unlike the 1847 example I showed you earlier, concern the production side of the industry, workers in production, and they're specific to it. Um, and uh, on this topic, and harking back to Emily Faithful, I want to remind readers, hello, Marianne, of uh, Marianne's work on a topic that, of course, is very close uh, to my heart, women work and the Victorian periodical uh, press. So, uh, Chapter six uh, on women compositors in Faithful's Victoria Press paints a very different picture from the brutality of the system that Manby Smith 
describes and you know lucky workers actually um but i'm sure again marianne will have more to say about that now the conditions of other essential workers in the trade like bookshop assistants which manby smith also uh, talks of uh, and which i want to cover briefly fall under more general working conditions such as in discussions provoked by the early closing movement started in the 1840s, uh, which advocated for limited shop opening hours. Now, you think, what's this got to do with periodicals? Well, somebody's got to sell them. Uh, and it's precisely for this reason that I'm um, talking about it here. Now, throughout the 1860s, shop opening hours were agreed locally um, and were not legally binding. And sometimes bookshops were treated as exceptions anyway, and so didn't benefit uh, from the locally agreed uh, opening hours. And this had consequent effect upon bookshop workers. It was only in 1870 that the bookseller was to open a national debate about whether all bookshops across the country should agree to close earlier than uh, 7 p.m., some, like Longman's and the Religious Tract Society bookshops, already closed at six uh, to allow their assistants to get some fresh air. Uh, others should follow suit, uh, said the bookseller. The debate about um, closing hours lasted over 30 years, and it wasn't until 1904 that government finally legislated nationally. I, you know, I again, I want to stress uh, that you may think this is peripheral. Yeah, it is peripheral to media law as defined um, by um, books aimed at um, uh, journalists such as um, Ursula's. Uh, but it's nonetheless essential to consider the, these laws as well, thinking about how periodicals might be uh, available. Um, the early closing movement was but one body that sought to make conditions better for uh, workers connected to periodicals. The first national union of workers in the printing industry had been founded in 1830 with the subsequent expansion of a national typographical association. Now, these unions, these working associations applying pressure on working conditions, um, applied pressure on employers and in that sense sought to regulate the industry through contract law. And while not the earliest, the most influential is the London Society of Compositors formed in 1848. Um, it was not a national organisation and it only sought to improve conditions in the metropolis. But since London was where by far the biggest concentration of printers was located, the society wielded huge influence over a book as well as a periodical production. And in fact, it was an influence that uh, extended internationally right across Europe and the United States as well. The most significant intervention of the society in the 1860s occurred in 1866 when it demanded an increase in work rates. The first such demand since 1810, can you imagine? Because although it's true that prices were stable across most of the century after the Napoleonic Wars, by 1866, there'd been around a 10% increase in the cost of living since 1850. And rents had gone up by between uh, 15 and 20% for um, uh, industry workers. The society also sought to set a minimum wage of 36 shillings for a 58 hour week Ruppence an extra uh, hour for work conducted between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m., which is very common for newspapers and periodicals. The Association of Master Printers, founded in 1819, uh, which comprised major employers such as the very well-known printer publishers Close and Bradbury and Evans, who we always I always associate with with virtuous publications, um, responded that the present rate of 33 shillings a week for a 63-hour working week was reasonable, and that if their costs went up because of higher wages, well, jobs would simply go to the provinces, to Scotland, or to the continent. 
printers went on strike in, in protest. And by the end of 1866, the society had gained almost all its demands. These were, of course, not statutory agreements, but they were um, customary agreements, which nonetheless regulated um, the trade. I, uh, I hope we should say perhaps that um, uh, the, uh, so the society had to compromise. It only managed to get 60 hours a week instead of the 58 it had originally asked for. Um, much less well-known regulatory factors are the informal customs of printers that, though they've left little trace, um, nonetheless must certainly have exercised a powerful force. And these might actually be considered illegal were they not sanctioned by custom. Uh, for example, um, there are something called taxes, that they call taxes um, in the printing industry, that either inflated the price of ink or uh, lowered its quality. These taxes include one-off gifts by ink manufacturers to printers or their representatives to get them to buy their products, the liberal expenses uh, traditionally claimed by traveling salesmen, and most intriguing because most regularized, the traditional penny in the pound of ink chapel dues claimed by uh, the press workers themselves when the ink was bought by the master printer. These perks were certainly not legally sanctioned by statute. I see some of them you might think would be illegal, but they were by custom. And workers felt that that custom gave the right to them. And I think it's uh, an affect, a feeling that's typically engendered by a system of common law, which operates according to precedent. So I think this shows the limits of the law in terms of regulation and demonstrates very well what Ursula calls a, a hybrid co-regulatory system, even if what I'm describing is very, very different from the formal institutional self-regulation of the industry that she's referring to. Finally, and this is where the question of the effects of business ownership systems on the industry uh, comes in. And I'm very conscious of time, I'm trying to get to my see my watch, which I'm afraid is um, uh, uh, rather too smart for its own good, so I can't even tell the time on it when it sends me messages. Um, how was ownership of a publishing house conceptualized? And how was it put into practice? Now, the 1860s are significant for seeing the beginning of the results of the Limited Liability Act of 1855 and its slight modification in 1862. This is a, the area where Anne is, we really need Anne. So I, I'm very conscious I'm out on a limb here. While there was a sudden rise in incorporation after the 1862 Act, it's hard to gauge how many publishing houses moved to become formal limited liability companies. We find and co everywhere, but this doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that the publisher was officially recognized as a company. Similarly, multiple names on a title page didn't necessarily mean that a formal partnership existed between the publishers for anything more than one text. They simply agreed to share the costs and thereby the risks of publishing, and they may not even have put that in writing, um, other than on the title page, when it's just, which is very late in the process. Um, and this not putting things in writing. It's really fundamental to a case that we'll, uh, I will end with. Publishing uh, remained fragmented into many small independently run businesses owned by an individual, a family, or at most a partnership of several individuals. Even if some of them did raise uh, or so issue shares to raise capital. They remained private in the sense the shareholders were few in number and knew each other. These did not have to register as companies with the state. But if they were publishing newspapers, 
they did have to register the paper with the Inland Revenue. So periodicals didn't have to register, but newspapers did. And newspapers had to deposit £400 surety if based in London, £300 outside it, against, guess what? Blasphemous, seditious and personal libel. That's not to say matters were legally simpler than with a public limited company owned by many shareholders, which we see at the end of the 19th century and certainly the rhizomatic, um, the situation that we have now. Uh, there was very many forms of mortgaging, remortgaging, bills of trade, verbal and written contracts. Oh, goodness, it creates such a complex system that if a case came to court, the press could find it difficult to report it clearly, and even the judge might come to an uncertain conclusion. And this is where I want to end with the last case. I want to end with the story of a complicated couple of intertwined court cases in 1863 that illustrate the really very difficult situation regarding ownership. They show how publishing was not some abstract, symbolic, ver verbal transaction, but anchored firmly in the material, in buildings, machinery, typeface, each of which had a separate value beyond intangible intellectual property. Um, it, we also see um, the importance of uh, the personal through reliance on networks and apparent verbal agreements. And this is why I put that picture of Fleet Street from the 1880s up, because I think it, it wonderfully demonstrates the material nature of the production of periodicals, very, very material, how there are things there that uh, generate periodical. Okay, the suits Hutton versus Beaton and Beaton versus McMurray were aptly described in the Daily News in 1863 as extremely complicated. And because of the sketchy written records the parties kept or admitted to keeping, it was only possible to progress the case at all because of the legal necessity to register with the inland revenue the ownership of the newspapers involved. Had they been um, uh, periodicals, there would be no record at all. It would be a complete nightmare. The story is this. A saddler named uh, Shipley, George, uh, John George Shipley, came to co-own three sporting newspapers jointly with John Hutton, the publisher of a mass market newspaper, The Weekly Times. The, these papers were the Twice Penny Weekly Sporting Life, which may very well be familiar to us. It still survives online, founded in 1858. Um, there was the uh, uh, the Eclipse and Sporting Calendar. I can't, uh, couldn't get, because you can't order anything in the British Library, so I couldn't get to anything that was not online, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, that's a quite obscure um, uh uh, weekly, a Tuppany weekly. And then we've got uh, the Sporting Telegraph, um, a twice weekly uh, penny paper. My records from um, having uh, looked at these um, some time ago uh, tell me that the prominent and repeated adverts for Shipley's primary business of furnishing leather accoutrements for gentlemen and the army uh, in these uh, three papers suggest that Shipley was clearly hoping for a synergistic interaction of shop and press, whereby the latter would advertise the former. Uh, you can see that in the adver advert I've uh, uh, reproduced there for you from the Volunteer Service Gazette and Military Dispatch. But uh, Shipley seems to have overextended itself. The, uh, the eclipse was the issue, in fact. It was making uh, a huge loss. In 1860, he mortgaged his half of the papers to one William McMurray. If I, yes, there you go. It's come up. Uh, William McMurray was a paper maker. And then, oops, nonetheless... Shipley went bankrupt in February the following year.
As a result of Shipley's bankruptcy, his half of the papers, along with their copyright, this is where I'm really uh, the point of this, really, along with their copyright, the plant involved and the leasehold of the premises, just listen to those elements, became the property of William McMurray. The Sporting Telegraph was discontinued and McMurray sold his half in the two remaining papers to one of the customers of his paper business. Oops, there you go, Samuel Beaton. The ambitious publisher of the English Woman's Domestic Magazine, which I know that many of you will know very well. Um, unsurprisingly, um, adverts for Beaton's products take the place of Shipley's in the two remaining papers. Um, Beaton and Hutton were uh, legally registered in March 1861 as the owners of the sporting life and the Eclipse, subject to two mortgages by Beaton to McMurray, which is why McMurray's name is there between um, in uh, uh, a lighter colour between square brackets. Now, what I'm about to claim is disputed in court, as the written records did not accord with the claims made in court. But it seems that because Hutton was in debt to McMurray for £10,000 and did not respond to communications, McMurray sold Hutton's moiety of the papers to Samuel Beaton. Meanwhile, Beaton spent a good deal of money successfully improving the two papers and raising their circulations. Hutton, though, ah, oh, reappeared uh, in uh, the end of 1862, claiming the sporting life was still his and demanding his share of the by now considerable profits. When Beaton refused, well, Hutton took Beaton to court. Beaton then took McMurray to court, claiming that Hutton was merely the papermaker's puppet. The question at stake was now, who owned what? In the end, the judge found in favour of Beaton, uh, though he reserved the right change his mind when he was able to return to the matter in November. He didn't change his mind, I have to say. Meanwhile, the sporting life on the eclipse, I love this, continued completely uninterrupted with no sign of the legal turmoil underneath them, which of course, uh, uh, it was enabling them to exist at all. Now, I'm sure everyone's head is spinning after my account of that trial. Just trying to sort out the graphics was a bit of a nightmare, let alone sort out the story. The newspaper accounts of this story are themselves incredibly confusing. Uh, but this is, an, of course, another example of how the law works in systems such as the UK's, as both constraint and opportunity as guide and clarification and as obfuscation. And it's the vagueness that can provide the opportunity. Now, as I said, what I've tried to do with this sprint through selected elements of the law and the periodical press in 1860s England uh, is to point out not just the co-regulatory system involved in a liberal market oriented state, but also the variety of laws relevant to the distribution and production of the periodical press beyond the usual suspects. Not just control and regulation of access and content, but the complex definition of the multiple markets for labour and property ownership are at stake. Thank you very much.